live pop up. There it is. We're now live. Okay, awesome. Well, hello, everybody out there in the social media world, whatever platform you are following us on. My name is Shannon. Welcome to Monday, uh, Monday, Wednesday webinar series with the Hispano Chamber of Commerce. I'm so excited. We have such a great panel today. Another venture into this wonderful initiative that we're doing with the city of Albuquerque over the next six weeks, learning about all of the departments. What do they do? Who are the key players? What do you need to know as a small business owner, as somebody inside of the community? And how can you engage and interact with these departments to help grow your business or get your questions answered? So that's what we're doing. And I just want to do a quick shout out and a big thank you to the mayor's office for being part of this initiative, part of the Choose One campaign initiative that we partnered with the city of Albuquerque on. And also want to say a, a shout out to Stacy uh, Dragmeister for putting all of this together. And of course, our great marketing team, um, Angelique and Jamie as well. We appreciate it. We're going to spend the next hour buried deep inside culture, inside of our roots, everything that makes us Albuquerque, everything that makes us this beautiful city that we live in. And we have the panelists, the team here to help us get started. So ladies, I'd love to get you involved inside the conversation. And I'm just going to kind of go around in the order that you are on my screen if you could tell us who you are what your title is and, and all about your department so we're going to start with shell hi my name is shell sanchez i'm the director of the department of arts and culture and we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means it's a big place within the city of albuquerque and then i have two of uh the department's division managers here today so i'll let them introduce themselves brie you're next Hey, uh, my name is Brie Ortiz with the Department of Arts and Culture, and I am the Community Events Division Manager, um, which kind of oversees um, the city events, but also some venues such as the Chemo Theater, South Broadway Cultural Center, um, the large special events like Summerfest, Biopark City events like New Music, um, and then things in Old Town at the Rail Yard, special event permitting, so kind of a catch-all. Um, <laughs> Well, we're excited to talk with you, Brie, because we're so ready. We miss our city events so much. So we have so much to talk about. Sherry, you are next. Hi, I'm Sherry Brigman with the Public Art Urban Enhancement Division of the Department of Arts and Culture. And we oversee public art and um, the uh, grants for uh, actually contracts for services for uh, cultural programming for nonprofit arts organizations. Well, I can only imagine when you say art, thinking of all the art that's all over the city. So I can't wait to learn more about that. That's exciting to know who the face is behind all of that art that pops up around the city. So it's really exciting. So Shell, I know that there is a lot that happens within your department. I know that you have a great team that's going to help us break it down. But if you could just start sharing with us a little bit about the mission, the purpose of the department, and I just want to kind of turn it over to you for a little bit. Um, I know you have some slides and, and to kind of walk us through it. Great. Thank you. Let's see if I can transition to, does this mean you guys can see this? Yes. Awesome. That's so great. I'm usually not the one doing this. So here we go. All right. Okay, you've already met the three of us, so let's move on. Um, so the Department of Arts and Culture, I think one of the things that's really great to celebrate as a community is that we have a huge Department of Arts and Culture. And this is not true for um, most cities our size, not even most cities larger than us. Um, our city has really invested and taken on a ton of responsibility for our arts and culture in the city. That's also true at the state level um, here in New Mexico. And to me, that means a lot of things, but it, it mostly means that our taxpayers and our leadership, you know, city councils and mayors over the years have really embraced the importance of arts and culture in our civic life, but also just in the health and vitality of our city. So we have seven divisions within arts and culture. There's the ABQ Biopark, which includes all of those beautiful spaces, the zoo, Tingley Beach, the aquarium, Botanic Gardens, Heritage Farm, and our aquatic conservation facility. The Albuquerque Museum, which I'm assuming many people on, the, um, on this call have just seen the Frida exhibit, which is being packed up right now, going back to Mexico. Um, the Balloon Museum, 
the community events division. Bree just talked about um, all of the pieces of that. It's a really important um, a division that not only creates amazing events for the public, but also really has beautiful venues where other arts and cultural organizations present a lot of their events. The public library system, um, the Albuquerque Bernalillo County public library systems, that's 18, soon to be 19 branches around the city and county. Public art urban enhancement, that's Sherry's division. So she's gonna take a deep dive with you on that. And then we have one Albuquerque media, which includes GovTV and all of our public access stations, which those are traditionally, you, you know those on um, Comcast, but this team has really pushed out programming into a lot of streaming and now on-demand video. So this public access um, space is also really, really important. So those are all the divisions. And then there's this other piece that doesn't really get its own world, but the other thing we do at Arts and Culture is we really promote and connect the arts and culture of our city and the amazing things that are happening um, from our artists, from our arts and cultural nonprofits. We really try to champion and advocate all of their work. So I feel like depending on the week, sometimes that should have its own little division, um, but it's some of my favorite work to do. So let's see if I can remember how to move forward. Oh, there it is. So the operating budget um, for arts and culture is over $40 million. It's gonna be about $42 million, hopefully when council approves the next budget. And this, is, this helps us to manage 500 employees and uh, depending on how you wanna count things, around 33 to 36 individual sites. So this is a huge department. It's one of the largest departments in the city. And like I said, there are just maybe, might be one comparable department at the city level across the country in terms of venues and city employees. And that $41.1 million, that's our operating budget. Right now we have about 40 to $50 million in capital projects underway. And you know, capital projects, that's construction and manufacturing. It's all kinds of really important things. Whenever we invest in these facilities, we're also investing in all of these other sectors. So just to kind of get you a sense, like sometimes we think of arts and culture in these really pretty spaces that we experience, but they are really important uh, economic drivers because we have a lot of small businesses that we contract with every year we put out um, at least $1.2 million in contracts every single year to nonprofits. And nonprofits are businesses, right? I mean, they have a little bit different structure, but they gotta make money, they've gotta employ people, they have to provide services. They are part of our economic fabric. Um, but usually we're, we're putting out between 1.2 and $2 million into the arts and cultural uh, nonprofit community. We have vendors at all of those sites. So our museums and our biopark. And then Bree is gonna talk about how many vendors uh, are coordinate through community events. Artisans, same thing, lots of opportunities, individual artists, and then um, our contractors. And you know the thing that's not well represented here is that arts and cultural tourism is so important, right? That is a huge driver, not just for our artists, but for kind of the whole community. So as, as we strengthen our arts and cultural venues and all of these wonderful things that, that we do in our spaces, that brings people here. You know, we had people driving in from all over the region for the Frida Kahlo show that just closed. And we have had that experience in lots of places. And there's, so there's a lot of things. The Biopark is the most visited um, cultural attraction in the state. So these are really important in terms of economic impact. So I'm gonna hand it over to Bree and she can talk about, I think everything says in a typical year, right? Everything says that everywhere now because we're kind of kind of skip over last year. So let's just <laughs> pretend that we're moving forward. So in a typical year, Bree, talk to us about your department. 
Oh, your division. Year. So um, she'll kind of mention that we're kind of split. So we have city events that we program, we plan, we hire the bands, we put together. And then um, some of our venues are rentals. So that is for other um, nonprofits, performance groups, touring groups, um, rent some of the spaces such as the chemo theater. So in this typical year, what's on your screen is actually just what here in arts and culture, what we plan and put together um, for the community. So in a typical year, we have 111 events um, throughout town, that's everything from Summerfest to concerts in Old Town um, at all different venues and throughout Balloon Fiesta and different concerts that we do. So 111 normal events, um, 281 performances. So that's, um, you know, we for summertime in Old Town, we have three concerts a year during the summer or during a week during the summer. So these are just actual concerts and performances that we hire and put together and promote. Um, we have 416 vendor opportunities. So what that means is for a summer fest um, between food truck opportunities, um, artisan market booths that we have, breweries and wineries who come and vend in our events, um, just all the different opportunities from Freedom Forth, um, Renaissance Fair, everything we put together, 416 individual opportunities for businesses to get involved. Um, and then we hire ab about 950 bands a year at the to perform at our different venues and different events. So just being able to um, support our local economy, our creative economy, and help all these people, that's, we depend on them. We can put the event together, but without all of these businesses participating in performances, we really wouldn't have any events. So we're ready for that typical year to come back. <laughs> um, we all took a break and had to do the classic pandemic pivot. Um, oh, you said pivot. You said pivot. Uh, hiding behind the screen is a young lady who has to come slap me on the hand because I use pivot so often. <laughs> but you guys have seen that episode of Friends where Ross is trying to get the couch up the stairs and he's yelling, yeah. pivot. So they send that to me on a regular basis. So I just want them to know pivot is a, is a word that we're allowed to use because that's what we had to do in 2020 was pivot, yeah. pivot, pivot. So thank you for using that. <laughs> Welcome, pivot. Um, so for what we had to do was, okay, you know, we couldn't have events, we couldn't have gatherings, our whole everything is built on mass gatherings. So to be creative, um, and to still keep businesses and performers involved, that was what we really wanted to do. Because at the end of this, we need them all to exist to help entertain and bring us back together and come to our mass gathering. So what could we do during this bizarre time that we hope we don't have to go through again, um, but just make sure that we can keep all of these performances um, and businesses operating and partnered with us. So one thing we did was called DIY Media. At the very beginning um, of last year, we put out applications for um, different artists to help us program the GovTV stations that Shell was talking about. So we partnered with GovTV, we put out applications and different creatives in the economy applied to submit whether it was we had um, bands perform and they did living room concerts, um, different educational pieces, artists doing artist demonstrations. Um, and we were able to pay them for all of their content that we put on the station. So that was very exciting. Um, it was a lot of work because that was at the beginning when we didn't use streaming as much. And so we learned a lot right at the beginning. Um, so streaming concerts. Last year, we did a few streaming concerts, some at the zoo um, and um, at the Botanic Garden and different places that we could stream them and put them on GovTV, put them on all of our channels um, and really help the artists. And we were able to pay them for their performances as well. Um, so since we couldn't have the beloved Twinkle Light Parade for the holidays, we invented the Route 66 Shop and Glow. So we actually um, rented some of the River of Light sculptures from the garden, and we put them in businesses throughout Knob Hills, and we were able to pay the businesses to partner with us. We promoted their curbside or delivery, whatever they were offering at the time. And in their windows, we put um, some of the River of Light sculptures. And so it was really a way for the community to go out enjoy the holiday season while they're supporting local businesses. Um, we also did grab and go market. So we repurposed hold my ticket is what we typically use for ticketing at our venues. Um, so for chemo, um, whenever people have concert tickets, it's through hold my ticket. So we repurposed hold my ticket and built like an online platform that us as a city operated and built 
Um, and instead of buying tickets, you were buying things from local artisans. So um, we got all the product information and prices from the artisans that would typically be at one of our art markets or a holiday market. Um, we built the sites, so people could purchase their tickets, which were items. We had the um, artisans come hand drop it to us we packaged it up for customers and customers were able to come pick up curbside. So it was a super safe way that people could still shop local, um, support their local artisans that maybe, you know, don't have a brick and mortar and they really needed the support for us to be able to keep with their products. So everything from soap, jewelry, food, different um, items. And then we just wrapped up Albuquerque's 315th birthday. Um, traditionally we do an event in Old Town to celebrate the birthday, but in a, in true pandemic fashion, how can we support local businesses? So we did a two week campaign. We partnered with 53 local businesses that offered a special um, in their store. So Boxy Bear brewed a special beer, Rebel Donuts had donuts, um, Rude Boy Cookies did special, really adorable, cute cookies. People had discounts, um, different things throughout the two week period. And we just pushed people to these businesses to shop local. We did business highlights and featured it on GovTV as well as on all of our platforms. So. We did a lot, we were still really busy. I think people ask me all the time, like, but oh, you still have, a, you're still working? Are you not working? Are you at home? It's like, I feel like this is harder and we're busy than, than putting on our typical event. So we've definitely been busy, but we are ready to get back to normal <laughs> and gather again. All right. Thanks, Bree. I'm sure people are gonna have a lot of questions for you because you do so many cool things that involve, involve artisans. Um, oh, you got a couple more slides. Oh yeah, so this is just, these are just the numbers broken down for what we just talked about. So um, during the pandemic, we were able to hire 160 performers. Um, and so some of our drive throughs where we'd pick up curbside, we had some performances in the parking lot. Um, we did streaming concerts and, and different things um, throughout the pandemic. And then 49 for that DIY artisans for the makers that we did last year, 31 businesses and 15 artists participated in the Shop and Glow. So the artist part too is we also hired some artists to do some um, displays in some of the non Hill businesses. So people could drive by safely if they wanted to, or they could pick up their curbside items from not hell. So. Great. Oh, and it's still going. It's and going. You <laughs> do so much. And 156 businesses participated in um, the grab and goes and then 48 businesses and eight artists in the Albuquerque birthday. So um, and then there's just a picture you can kind of see that we have some performers at the rail yards during one of our curbside grab and go markets. And we also did a food truck, a drive up food truck type festival at the rail yards last summer. So that great. Okay, that's it. I'm done. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so exciting to see how you continue to contribute to our creative economy, figured out ways to get musicians and artisans and vendors and small businesses involved. <clears throat> and I I mean, I know because, you know, being with the chamber, we're very involved. I know what's happening in the community, but I think that there's a lot of people that don't realize how you had to move things through to get this done. And it's also an incredible way to support um, the local artisans that really, really need the support. They suffered so much from musicians to vendors, to artisans, to art, you know, whatever, painters, sculptors. They use festivals and events to sell their products. So kudos and thank you to this department for doing that. Those are really great numbers. Yeah, well, thank goodness everyone in this department is really creative. <laughs> All right. So Sherry, talk us through public art. And this is, I, I feel like this uh, program sometimes goes a little under the radar, which is crazy because so much of the work they do is out in public spaces. But um, I think understanding the level of impact in the community uh, is, you know, sometimes overlooked. So tell them all the amazing things you guys do, Sherry. Okay. Um, so our division has four primary programs, well, four and a half. Um, the first one is the 1% for public art program. And then we have the Urban Enhancement Trust Fund, which is funding for arts and cultural organizations. We also have the satellite galleries. We also have the Veterans Memorial Review Committee. And we're kind of the division, the catch-all division for the creative placemaking efforts throughout the city. Uh, next slide, Shell. 
awesome. Okay, so the public art program um, in Albuquerque is the 15th oldest public art program in the United States. Uh, we were established in 1978 uh, with the funding mechanism and 11 arts board members. And since that time, we've had 103 volunteer arts board members um, serve on this board. And this past year, uh, in the past 15 months, we had 18 virtual meetings. Um, our collection currently has about uh, 1,200 works of art in the both the 2D, small D collection and large outdoor sculptures that we know a lot of people see around the city. We got so much feedback during the pandemic of people who were just so happy to go outside and check out public art sculpture in their neighborhoods. Um, just as a little, little bit of information about what we did during the pandemic, during our normal year, uh, normal funding year, we, we purchase about $45,000 in two-dimensional work from artists. We have different calls and we purchase artwork. This past year, our pandemic pivot, it's not really a pivot, a pivot but um, we purchased $350,000 in 2D artwork from artists throughout New Mexico, but we really focused on Albuquerque artists. And we did a special invitation for artists who were in the uh, canceled, literally like overnight, um, Indian market and Spanish market. So that was an excellent opportunity for us to work with those artists who rely on those, you know, those internationally renowned markets. Uh, next slide, Shel. Um, our other program is the Urban Enhancement Trust Fund, and um, that was established in 1985, along also with an advisory board member of 11 people. And to my knowledge, I've done a lot of research on this, we are the only municipal trust fund that has that sort of resource for funding arts and cultural programming. 90% um, of the interest earnings from the trust fund every year are collected and put together um, to fund the arts and cultural organizations in our community for all kinds of programming and 10% goes back into the trust fund itself. So that trust fund is always increasing. And um, on average, every two years, we've in for the, the past four, five cycles, we've been funding about $350,000. Um, during the pandemic, uh, we tapped in and scraped the bottom of that barrel of those interest earnings and was able to put out another round of special recovery funds for our, our nonprofit arts organizations. We were also able to utilize our process for CARES funds that we receive from the federal government. And we are just about to release the um, award notifications for the current funding cycle. So in 15 months, we will have awarded about $1.2 million in funds for arts and cultural organizations. So our division pivot, like I said, is not really a pivot. We just did more, more, more of the same thing that we always do. And we nearly quadrupled um, our financial impact on our creative economy in, in those 15 months. Um, next slide. Um, the satellite galleries uh, program is a division that was, uh, is a program that was moved into our division in 2018. And um, it includes the South Broadway Cultural Center Gallery, the Chemo Gallery, and other um, galleries throughout the community. We're super excited to announce that there's going to be a new gallery in the first floor of City Hall. And we also partner with other venues such as the Balloon Museum for doing artist exhibitions with inside, inside other spaces. And, and um, on average, we serve about 200 artists per year throughout those various venues. Um, uh, as I mentioned that we're gonna have a, a, new, a new space in City Hall post pandemic as buildings start to open up, but we're gonna have more historic type of exhibitions in the chemo, in the chemo theater and um, more open calls for uh, group exhibitions um, coming up next year. Okay, next slide. Um, we also oversee the Veterans Memorial Review Committee, and that is a small committee that reviews all of the um, memorials that are proposed for our incredible New Mexico Veterans Memorial Park um, out on Louisiana, Louisiana Boulevard near Gibson. Um, it is a beautiful park. It is artistically designed, and we have an incredible committee that works really hard to make sure that our, vet our veterans are honored with the, the best looking and most appropriate memorials in the state. Um, and then finally, what, as I mentioned, we're kind of a catch all for the creative placemaking efforts, and that includes um, national grants working with national organizations and partnering, um, lots of partnerships with exploring place making and place knowing 
And um, we're, we're pleased to announce that we are now the recipients of our third um, Our Town grant. And um, we're partnering with some other, di other divisions of city government on some Bloomberg applications. And so it's just super exciting to be a support team, not always with the money. Sometimes we get the money, sometimes we're just support um, on creative place making, creative place knowing. And our next big project is going to be along the proposed rail trail. Um, between the rail yards and Lomas. So I want to invite everybody who's creative or interested in cre creative projects to join our public art e-newsletter. Um, that can be found at our webpage at cabq.gov slash public art. And you can just click on the tab that says newsletter, sign up for the newsletter, and you can get um, all the first, uh, first information about what our division is doing um, from that newsletter. And I think, is that my... That's the last of my slides. Right, um, and you can find out more at, at um, cultureabq.com and cultureabq at cabq.gov. You can just email a question and it will get to the right person. So that's the best email for our whole department if you don't know who you're looking for. Um, and then these two fabulous um, leaders just partnered on um, Mural May, which was launched over the weekend. So it's a great example of community events and public art. We have such a vibrant and diverse um, scene when it comes to murals. Many of those murals are public art murals, as in funded by the city on public buildings, but there's a lot of other wonderful murals that are on private buildings, funded privately, and there's some that are both funded with a little bit of public money on a private building. So. Um, there's a lot going on uh, when it comes to our mural scene. We had envisioned a really big festival with like music and artists at those places, but stay tuned for 2022. In the meantime, you can go to our website and um, participate in our virtual Mural May, learn about the murals. There's some great videos about the muralists and uh, you can go visit them on your own. And then next year we'll be there all together. And there so, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> So much happening within your department. It's amazing uh, what is going on. I, and I definitely want to break it down um, into some more specifics that I think are, are really important for, for everybody to know. And so, Shaw, I kind of want to start with you a little bit since we talked about those seven divisions that really, um, you know, make up the department. And uh, I think we all, <laughs> we're all real aware of the biopark and the museum. Even the balloon park on Friday, I made a comment to say the balloon fiesta, you know, rents, leases the park from the city uh, during that time. And it's confusing, confusing to some because everybody's like, oh, I'll call somebody from balloon fiesta. If you need to rent the park or you need to lease the park, if you have a sporting event or you want to hold an event, you have to call this department in order to get that done you you don't just or actually there's somebody there at the balloon that you can talk to but it's it's not the balloon fiesta so there's that weird you know confusion in the public um little things like that the community events wow i mean we cannot wait till we bring those back hopefully just in time for for fall and then of course hopefully um the the twinkle light parade back in full force this year would be really amazing something that I know the kids and Knob Hill misses quite a bit for sure. Yeah. Public libraries and of course the public are urban's uh, enhancement or urban enhancement. But I wanna talk about this Gov TV. So I know that um, I've, I've seen it many, many times because we've actually used it on some platforms, but let's talk about who's it for, how do you connect, uh, you know, talk a little bit about that. I think uh, that's a, a great, um, topic for uh, the public to understand what it is. Well, um, so GovTV is one channel out of four channels that we have that are public access. So we have um, GovTV local access or local origination, public access and education. And these are all um, channels on Comcast. And so there's a Comcast franchise fee that um, Comcast pays to the city and that's what funds um, those channels and funds that work. And over the pandemic, as Bree said, none of us were, you know, none of us stopped working. We kept working and that particular division um, completely redid the public access studios. So now there's studio 519 at 519 Central. So if you, um, if you have a show, if you want to 
create a show, if there's special um, work that you want to do, or you just want to learn how to create content, you can actually go and sign up and work with the public access studio and our contractors over there. And that um, you learn how to use the equipment or you work with them and partner with them and you can create content for public access. And the nice thing that's really moved is that um, the leadership of that team, so that's Diego Lucero, has really said, you know, Comcast is great. Um, a lot of people have Comcast, but we all get our media in a lot of different spaces. So that content that we show on Comcast, we also stream through our YouTube channels. We also now have um, the equipment so that you can get it through on demand. Um, I don't know. I'm going to start acting like I know what I'm talking about, but somebody can jump in. But you know, the, if you have like Apple TV, I don't. But I know that there's um, on demand TV um, uh, methods and you can actually stream that content in these other spaces as well. So we haven't stayed um, content, right? Just to, to do what we've always done. We've really been pushing to get the content out there. And I think local, like locally created content is really important. One of the things um, that Brie talked about was the DIY media and Diego and Brie really figured that out. And they had like two weeks to figure it out and get it out there and start doing it. They did a great job. And it turned into this year, a program that we call Virtual Visionaries. And one of the shows that I think is so great is um, a couple who's doing um, like a little tour of Albuquerque restaurants. So they got a contract with the city and they've done a really nice show about like these kind of quirky Albuquerque restaurants. So it, it really feeds the whole artistic and cultural community when all of the divisions of arts and culture are working together well and we're working with the community. That's when we're really pushing the city forward. So I guess just to reiterate, because it's so exciting, uh, and I want to make sure the public knows that they could reach out to Studio 519 if they have an idea, maybe a concept they'd like to maybe talk about, see if it fits within kind of the purview of the work that the studio is doing for, for uh, GovTV, uh, because you never know these creative minds come up with this amazing stuff. And so you, you might be uh, part of a really cool new project with the city. So if you're looking to say, how do I get involved? This could be the way. And so um, that's a really cool key point um, in that the city is inviting the help of the, the public or the creativity of the public. Um, and I absolutely love that. I want to jump over to Bree for just a second. You really broke down those events. We talked about specifically the people that were impacted, the numbers, which I think is amazing to be able to track that. We're getting really good at data over here for the first time. So we're really, it's like, okay, who do we talk to? What do we do? And we do a lot of follow-up now. So we're learning the importance of data. So it's very exciting to me and I'm very interested in it. But I noticed that um, one of the things you, you said that was in a typical year, you know, and 950 or so performers. Now, if you are a performer, musician, dancer, let's talk a little bit about where did they go? How do they get involved? How do they get registered? How do they put their name in the hat to be able to be called on or selected to participate in some of these events? Yeah, so we're all looking for new performers. Um, so on our website, physicaltrabq.com, there's a link right on the our homepage that says perform at a city event. So mm -hmm. it's a little application. So they're able to give about them if they have any links for social media. We do ask for video examples um, just to show that they really do know how to perform in front of in front of people. Um, and anyone who is qualified and a good fit. We also really like original music. So any performers, mm -hmm. any bands that's original music. We, I mean, we all love a good cover band too, but we really look for that to just show that they're they're creating um, some music. And then same with dancers too. We love, you know, having dancers. Performance is an old town. We program um, close to a hundred concerts in old town every year. So we are all over any performances. So just go to our website and we'll get the information. Wow. So that would probably go for vendors as well. So maybe they sell, I don't know, lemonade or hot dogs or, you know, some of the things that you do when you have your big events, you have your vendors, how do they get registered? What do they need? Um, yeah, to do? And all my applications everywhere now because yeah. they see food trucks everywhere. I know. And that's exciting for us. We're glad they're still around. Um, so that whenever we have events, we'll have um, applications on our website. 
for artisans and for food trucks and food vendors. Um, and that's really what we're looking for. We're looking for people that um, have good trucks. They have all of their health permits and a variety. We try to give everybody an opportunity. So, you know, uh, we have four summer fests every year. So depending on space, we're basically just play Tetris on the streets or wherever we are. So we'll have, we take as many as we can fit and we try to give everyone an opportunity um, and, and a mix of food when it comes to the food vendor. So we don't want just a whole bunch of New Mexican food trucks lined up. So we want something for everybody. Um, but yeah, whenever we open up for events again, we'll definitely put all the applications and um, opportunities on our website. So, um, and here's another question for you. So let's say that somebody wants to do their own event on say a city street or inside uh, downtown. You know, I know at one time uh, there was a big car guy, car club that was gonna do a big car show downtown. What do, where do they need to go and how do they apply for that permit? So also on our um, website, we oversee special event permitting. So anytime an event um, impacts more than three city departments, so what you describe having something on a street, um, anything large that is going to impact more than three city departments. So um, so if it is, if you're going to block downtown central to have a, a car show, you're affecting transit because buses go that way, um, DMD because it's street, APD for safety, um, solid waste is actually a trash. <laughs> So um, all, you know, and then barricading. And then if you have food trucks, environmental health is involved. If you have noise, also environmental health, who does noise. So really any event like that really will need a special event permit. Um, the link's on the website. Again, right on the homepage on the right, it says apply for a special event permit. You go in there and we walk you through the whole system. We have um, some online software um, that you can upload, apply for your event. And we, it comes to um, our office first. So we can coach the event planner to make sure they have all the right right paperwork um, right now something we're doing different because not all events are allowed we are allowed to um, permit farmers markets and drive-in events currently and so we help with we help them through everything so a social <coughs> kind of agreement and their plan is something different that they're uploading right now so we can just so they know that um, you know they have to follow the rules and what their plans are for that and then once we, we're done with that we push it and all the other departments have to uh, look at their piece and approve or ask questions to the event planner. So, how are you guys handling um, event permits for, say, 2022? Just making it up. That you know they're they're thinking they want to go back to these normal events. Are they on hold temporarily? Do they go ahead and start the process and then they'll get updated? Like, what is the process for that? We've actually had a couple of people reach out and say, "Where do I go?" I'm like, "Well, you got to apply with the city," but then I don't know with COVID rules, you know, what what we should do if we should plan that far ahead. Yeah, so what we're doing right now, because we want the world to come back to and want everyone to be safe and, and have fun. So we're letting everyone put in their applications and that's when it just sticks with us. So they can put in their regular world applications and we just have Day of the Tread come through, um, Duke City Marathon, things like that. We'll just hold on to it, make sure they have all their pieces. And as soon as they're allowed, then we'll work with them to push it through the departments and get approved. So right now they can submit and start planning. And um, I think a lot of things that I've planned before is like they just keep changing the date, but we can help them change the date on their application as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's good information because that is something that our culture, our city, our community is so used to as events, whether it's through the city or it's private events, but they bring people together and that's what makes us culture. Here. I think that's why we're so different in our city, so unique uh, versus maybe other cities around the country. So I love that information. I'm going to use it because that's a question I get asked often. And speaking of a question that I get asked, I got to go to Sherry for a few minutes here because funniest story, this actually came to us as a question, you know, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder who I should reach out to on this. And now I know who to. So please, let's talk a little bit. I actually have two questions for you. One of them, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, the rail trail. And the reason it came up is we had a couple of members who are along the rail trail asking, who do they need to contact and how do they get involved? What is the, you know, what is the purpose? What's the art? What do they need to do? Um, because they are literally on the rail trail. So let's talk about that a little bit for maybe um, people that don't know what that is, the purpose of it, and then how we can, we can get them engaged with you. Sure. So um, we're um, 
just about to establish um, our art selection committee. And that means I have a list of all of the neighborhood association lead contacts and we'll be emailing them later this week, asking for a representative to actually serve on that committee. And so that's the neighborhood level um, participation. And then once we pull that committee together, we have a draft call for artists and we'll all review that, make sure that we're comfortable with the requirements and the, and the eligibility and um, what the artists will need to submit to be considered. And then we'll announce that to the artists in the community. In this particular project, we're working with the UNM um, Indigenous Design Planning Institute, as well as the Downtown um, Arts and Cultural District and um, the surrounding neighborhoods. So we've got a, a big committee we're going to pull together, um, but it is going to be limited to artists working in the core downtown area. And this is the smallest geographic region that we have um, created for a call for artists. And we want artists that are going to, that are from here, that are, that want to stay here, that really want to um, um, invest their time and energy and creativity into into the rail trail. It's going to be temporary public art that will be close to the rail trail. There's no actual access that we can have getting close to the railroad tracks. Obviously, there's a lot of safety protocols and things that are that are in place for that. Um, but uh, we'll be looking for artists who want to do temporary public art. Uh, close to the rail trail that can help us envision what maybe uh, a pedestrian or bicycle trail might actually feel and look like into the future. I'll just so, jump in you, for a little bit. Sure, I think sure. I'll go back, like zoom out a little bit. So, you know, that the idea of the rail trail is really to create more um, connection, pedestrian and bicycle, Sherry just referred to it there, connection from the rail yards, which as it continues to be invested in and redeveloped, to um, Lomas, there's like there's so many important things in to our downtown that are in that corridor, and they're yeah. all kind of disconnected, right? So we've got the we've got the rail yards, we've got Alvarado Station, we have um, Innovate ABQ, we have like the the great um, development that's going down where Via Miriam is and um, the Garcia's properties. We have uh, the Convention Center right there. We have so much of these. We have the one Albuquerque. There's so many things that. Um, have been created and what the city is really looking to do is is to like physically connect those so that you can easily walk move between them um, so especially if you're a visitor or you're a downtown resident you can move between those spaces really easily and we want to make it a destination right we want to make it a place that people want to go and walk or bike or whatever. And so um, that's why public art is a partner early on. I think for businesses and um, for property owners, developers that are really interested, they should reach out to um, Metropolitan Redevelopment Agency. So Karen Iverson, who's really leading those conversations in the community um, and, and working with DMD, because it's, it's complex. I mean, what makes it really cool is the rail um, what makes it kind of complex is the rail. So, right, we want people to walk and be able to traverse. So, you know, we're looking at all of these things. How do we do that? Get permissions, keep people safe, but also just make it a really cool, um, connected uh, downtown. So that's kind of where we're headed. Well, and you have a lot of little one-offs downtown too that are just really tourist attractions, but local, you know, still local. You've got the Turquoise Museum, you have the beautiful historic on the loose, Hotel on the loose. Then you have, you know, now we have 505, the, the food court downtown. There's so much that's happening. And so it's neat to be able to say, hey, this is the trail, but we're gonna kind of walk off here and enjoy us. And, and also it gives you time to explore it over time. You don't have to do it all in one day either. So that's really, really exciting. But you, we did. We had a couple of businesses reach out that are on your rail trail. So, so tell us again, it's from the rail yards. How far down will it be going? Well, I mean, the, the full vision um, is from the rail yards um, to Lomas. Wow. So, hey. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty significant. And then, you know, there's, I think as we look, um, I mean, as we develop the city, we develop our core, like finding these opportunities for connection um, through different modes of transportation that are, you know, not car modes, bike modes, walking modes, you know, other kinds of um, bus modes. These are, this is really what kind of strengthens um, our, our creative economy, but also our, our cultural tourism, right? Because people want to just be able to come and be able to go to a lot of places. So, and the rail is just an important part of our history. 
And so, you know, it's kind of building another layer on top of our history. And it also is, that rail is also right along the Camino Real. So we're just talking history and history and connection and connection, you know, time after time. So I think it's a good investment. But I think if businesses really want to talk to someone, um, you know, Sherry and I are, are excited to talk about it from a community perspective and an arts perspective, but they probably should talk to Karen Iverson Perfect. for Metropolitan Redevelopment. Oh, awesome. Well, Karen's a great friend of the chamber, so that'll be a great connection. You know, recently we were very lucky to get a presentation. I believe it's a, a group, and, and don't quote me, but they might have won a grant. I can't remember how it's involved with the city, but they're the ones that are doing the, the spirit uh, building, uh, I'm sorry, the boat building with the, with the spirit project at Rail Yards. And I love how you said the history of the rail yards community and what it's done for us. And as part of that presentation, they were talking about how they went back and found family members and they interviewed people that, you know, from the original rail yards. It's just, just this amazing concept and idea. I can't wait to see it, but I think it's really neat um, that I know that, that the city's involved in that project. So really awesome. So as we start to wind up the hour, like I always say in the beginning, we're going to be an hour in going, we wish we had two more hours. It always happens just because there's so much information and great information. And this department is so diverse in their amount of work from, you know, public art to, uh, to events, to anything you can think of that happens inside the cultural part, the cultural fabric, as Shell said, as part of our city. Um, is found here inside of arts and culture, uh, the arts and culture department. So as we start to kind of wind up the hour, I think really it would be nice to kind of just move around the screen. You know, we always uh, tackle COVID because that's where we're at. It made us who we are today in all of the departments and the way that we function. And I'd love to hear from you guys. What's something that you learned uh, through your department that maybe you're going to continue to work on or implement um, during this time? So Shell, we'll start with you. Um, well, you know, um, I think the thing that I learned is how important our cultural venues and our cultural spaces are to the community. And, you know, some of those are our permanent spaces like the biopark and the museums and the libraries. Um, you know, different people in our community are very, very connected to those spaces. It's part becomes part of their, you know, their daily or at least weekly life. And um, like when we had to take those offline, even for a little bit, it, it just came clear how important those were. But I also wanna say, you know, these events, these annual events, it was really, it was really hard for people. I mean, people reached out, they were very sad, right? That they weren't gonna be able to take their kids to the Twinkle Light Parade. I mean, people are like, can we just have a concert outside? Cause it's outside and outside is safe. And it's like, you know, you just, you can't. And so um, I think that we all knew that before, but it, it became very clear that we need these shared spaces. Uh, and they, they do more than just give us a place to take our five-year-old on a Saturday. Like it's, it's a lot more than that for people. So the, the services that we provide um, just became more and more clear how much it, it matters. And for me, the piece that I take away is I am so glad I work in a city that has financially invested in that. And I'm so happy that our city um, is, is healthy and solvent financially because there are lots of cities where arts and culture departments, even if they were only 20 people, have been decimated or some of them completely closed down. There are municipal zoos around the country who have had to cut a lot of staff. So I'm thankful to be here and that we have our entire department intact and we are still offering what we've always offered to the community. I mean, it's uh, it's a blessing and we should be should be really thankful that um, that our our budget and our leadership is solid and we are in such a good place as we hopefully come out of this together in the next couple of months. You know, I was on a, a webinar last week um, and they were talking about how the city did not have one furlough during COVID. And that is amazing considering how many cities literally had to shut down, had to become almost just stop, you know, dead in their tracks. 
And it's a, just a true testament of the leaders of the departments and the leadership really saying, hey, how do we pivot? <laughs> There's that word again, Brie. And how do we pivot? And how do we continue to make things move forward? And um, you know, what? how do we keep that upward trajectory of our community? And so it's it's been amazing to hear all of the stories. Uh, Brie, same question for you. Is there something you learned <clears throat> for your department that you're going to continue to use moving forward? What has COVID taught you? Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's kind of two two things here. One is um, so other you know some of the other venues people still have their regular jobs just in like a different capacity. We've had to like our job doesn't exist. We've had whole new jobs from this virtual um, for chemo and South Broadway. We've done a ton of repairs, so we are really excited when we do reopen the amount of work we've done um, in the facility. So I basically work for construction services now as well. Um, but I think not taking gathering for granted and not taking our regular jobs for granted. Um, you know, sometimes we had so many events, we get so burnt out because they're just back to back to back. Um, that sometimes you're just like, oh, I can't wait for this event to be over. I'm so tired. But then I want to be like, I can't wait for this event to happen. <laughs> I'm really excited for that. So I don't think we'll ever take anything for granted and just being open and being normal and being with people. Um, and then for a skill set thing, I think learning virtual stuff, um, being able, we've really mastered how to premiere videos and use videos on all of our social, link everything together, share that on how we get the messaging out. Um, and so keeping that skill as we move forward, I think will be really great. And that is new and different. Um, and at the chemo, we've actually installed streaming cameras permanently. So we'll mm -hmm. always have that capability um, to, and we work with GovTV and split that cost. So we'll be able right. to show, we'll be able to show things. So that's new and different too. So I think that don't take anything for granted. <laughs> I think in our regular lives too, but when it comes to events and don't take gathering for granted. Well, it sounds like maybe some collaborations that maybe wouldn't have happened, you know, because of COVID, like you said, with GovTV, the chemo. So again, you know, creativity is is really, uh, well, it's a, what is it, the necessity of all invention. So, uh, you know, collaborations were huge, obviously, during this time. And Sherry, same question for you. What is something, if anything, that COVID has taught you, what will you use moving forward? Well, for us, it's been really interesting because for many years, we knew that the public might know about like five, maybe 10, like someone who's really engaged in our community might know about 20 pieces of public art that, that they interact with. But we had such a, a huge outpouring of requests for public art maps all over the city. We were sort of underprepared for that. We have a great Google map where you can go see public art all over, but um, our, our data data, data, data. And so with that, uh, we were super excited to be selected by the Foundation for Open Government, the City Clerk's Office, and the Department of Information and Technology. Um, I'm sorry, Innovation and Technology. We are doing a public art hackathon in June, on June 12th and 19th, where after being locked down, working from home, we're gonna have all of our public art data in open source full, uh, files where uh, coders can download all that information, including photographs of the public art, the artist information, the date, and most importantly, the uh, geocoded information about where the public art is so that people can use all that open data. And so data, 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 we have 43 years worth of our public art board minutes available on the, on the city clerk's pages. So for us, it was all about just getting as much information out there as we can. And now that we have those in place, we're just gonna keep feeding that information. Wow, you know, we uh, uh, here at the chamber, again, <laughs> going back to, we gotta pivot and we gotta figure it out. You know, we have our commission tourism department. One of the things we're trying to figure out is how do we keep that in the forefront of everybody's mind? So we started our little, um, our little staycation program, which was what can you do in Albuquerque? And so we, it was so successful. You know, we were maxed at 20 to 30 people and some were social distance, whatever. But now that we start to open, people are reaching out with, we want to, we hope you continue the, pro the project because we loved doing that. We pair them with a local attraction, a restaurant, and then they stay in a local hotel and they have a little weekend of it, you know, with friends and family. So I would love to connect with you, Sherry, on this, uh, you know, uh, map, if you will, and maybe some of our, you know, quarterly art staycations can be exploring these 1,200 plus pieces of art that I had no idea exist in Albuquerque. I think that would be a fantastic way to stay connected to the city and stay connected to this project. So I'm going to 
get Mr. John Lewis in touch with you and we're going to figure this out. That's amazing. So I'm really, really excited to hear that because I'm also the one that's like, oh, we probably have 15 or 20 pieces. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see all the pieces. Well, I have to say, I've really, really enjoyed the hour. It has been really, really exciting to get to uh, know everybody and get to know what they do for arts and culture department and how we can engage. So as we close up, Shell, can you tell us how to get in contact with your department, uh, whether it's the you know email or website or whatever it is so that we can make sure that that gets posted and um, also uh, so that the public knows how to get with you. Absolutely. Well, you can always go to the city webpage, um, cabq.gov and search for arts and culture. And um, we have we do a great job of keeping updated on all of um, all the divisions, of course, or you can search for your favorite division on cbq.gov if you want to know more about the biopark or the Albuquerque Museum, public art, community events. Um, so that's a great uh, resource. And I'm going to ask Bree to give the email because she oversees the email. It doesn't, it sounds like Bree oversees uh, like everything, but I'm just saying it's a really big department. Um, but she does have community in the first, you know, word of her division. So what's the best email if people don't know where to start, Bree? Yes. The email is cultureabq at cabq.gov. And that comes to uh, me and our PIO. And so we're able to get it to the right person and help. And they're very good at email. So they're always updated. You always put the people that are good at email in charge of the like department email because then you know they won't get lost. Exactly. <laughs> That's true. Well, <clears throat> our time has come to an end. Um, I always say I wish we had more time, but I think this is something we should probably do at least once or twice a year as we start to reopen and we rebuild our events here in the city and all the new initiatives that will come out of what we've learned from COVID and building forward. And, and of course, the fabulous, um, uh, let's see if I get this right, Urban Enhancement Project, I believe, um, so that we can always be in the forefront of what is happening and, and be able to get that information out to the public as well. So I want to say a huge thank you to Shell and Bree and Sherry for spending an hour with us today and sharing uh, everything that, um, well, as much as we could get into an hour that has to do with arts and culture. And I just really, you know, I, I stress, if you guys have questions, reach out. The city departments are there to help you. If they can't help you, they're going to guide you to somebody that can. And so it's important that you just ask the question. Ask the question and they'll guide you. And if you can't get a hold of them, for some reason you don't know who to get a hold of, you can always reach out to us here at the Hispano Chamber and we'll always do our best to connect you um, the way, the best way that we can as well. So thank you to everybody behind the scenes. Thank you once again to the mayor's office, the Choose One campaign, choose to do something, choose to engage, choose to volunteer, choose to register as a performer or a vendor, choose to apply for a job, but choose to do something, volunteer, anything that works for you, but get involved with your city, get involved with your community and always get involved with us here at this model chamber of commerce. We will see you Wednesday where we get to meet another one or two departments and break them all down for you. But in the meantime, you guys have a fabulous week. It's beautiful outside. Go enjoy our beautiful city. We'll see you guys on Wednesday. Bye everybody.